it's time for us to check back in with Dory in Woman of the Mountains and see what happens next. If you've missed any of the previous readings, please look in the description below for a playlist. This next part of the book that we're going to start today, it spans the time frame of 1907 to 1912. Ma and Pa started work on the cabin so we'd have a place of our own. They scrubbed, mended, and filled cracks between the logs. The rock and mud fireplace had to be rebuilt. Pa built a lean-to for a kitchen. Ma papered the inside with newspaper brought back from Spartanburg. We thought it was the cleanest, prettiest house in the whole world. The front door faced the orchard. Two lopsided windows on each side of the door sparkled from their vinegar and water scrubbing. I was warned to watch out for Uncle Jimmy Mabel's big tom turkey, which he was fattening up to sell. He played with the turkey, teased it, and taunted it until it knew every mean trick. All of us girls were afraid of him. Ma sent me across the orchard to get a bucket of water out of Granny Jane's well. I got the water and was walking along, humming to myself, when something hit me in the back. I landed face down in the dirt, and the water bucket went flying through the air. The turkey had sneaked up behind me, taken a run and go, hit me with his big dirty feet, and flogged me with his wings. In a rage, I picked up the bucket and bashed him across the back again and again. I didn't hurt him. He waddled off as if nothing had happened. I dusted myself off and went to get another bucket of water. We always had to watch for him. His favorite hiding place was a drainage ditch in the middle of the orchard. From there, he could plan his ambush and never be seen. I was glad when he was sold to the peddler. It didn't matter to me if he was somebody's Sunday dinner. Pa and Uncle Dave went to Sevierville to get our furniture at the train depot. It had been there almost three weeks since he brought it from Spartanburg. Pa bought a shiny black step stove for Ma's new kitchen. Granny Jane fed us from her pantry since we had no food stored away. We'd been living off other people since Ma sold our food to buy tickets back to the mountains. The garden would be in soon and we could be self-sufficient again. Pa said he didn't like eating off of other people, benefiting from somebody else's hard work. We children did our share of the farming, but we had plenty of time to play. The days were long and warm. The woods called us to come, and our Indian blood answered. Cousin Richard, Cousin Arthur, and Uncle Noah would cut big grapevines, and we'd swing like monkeys from one side of the hollow to the other. We built playhouses in the side of the hills and covered the dirt floors with soft green moss. Flat slate rocks made fine furniture, and acorn caps were china fit for a queen. Our fashionable hats were made from tulip poplar leaves. Little twigs were used like straight pins to hold them together. Reed-like grass grew along the creek, and it became beautiful jewelry when we braided it and decorated it with dandelion and pink sorrel. Stone bruises covered our feet. Our legs and arms were scratched from climbing and rolling down the hillside. Ma said we acted worse than any wild Indian she had ever seen. Indians had claimed this place as their own a long time ago. Arrowheads of many sizes and colors could be found on the creek bottom among the rocks. Sometimes Pa or Uncle Dave would find them when they plowed up a new field. I wondered whether the arrowheads had washed down the streams from a distant place or whether the Indians had made them right where I stood. Some arrowheads were black, some gray, and some pink orange. Along the edges of the water, freshwater, or freshwater oysters and periwinkles clung to the rocks. Probably a little Indian had played here and wished that she, too, would remain a child and never have to leave. On Sundays, we had to become more civilized. Our sore feet were pushed into shoes, our bodies cleansed by the usual Saturday night bath, and we wore our best clothes taken down from the nails on the wall so we would appear as clean, well-bred children in church. We walked to the church and sang as we went. Sunday school was fun. The teacher gave us a small card with a picture and a Bible verse to be memorized for the next Sunday. The pictures were beautiful. Sometimes we'd get Moses with the Ten Commandments, Moses parting the sea, Moses as a baby in the basket, or one of many different pictures of Jesus. 
My favorite card was one of Jesus standing outside a door, knocking to get in. The verse said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. And that was in Revelation 3.20. Preachers who came to Oldham's Creek believed in preaching the wrath of God. Sometimes they'd get caught up in a sermon, raising their voices and shouting. They'd pace back and forth, pointing their fingers at the sinners in the church. When I thought of all the small sins I'd committed during the week, I could see the black smoke of hell boiling up behind them and smell the brimstone seeping up between the cracks in the floor. God was seldom presented as a God of love. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, echoed from the ceiling and pierced the souls of the listeners. My Sunday school card said God is love, while the preacher said fear the Lord. I felt more fear of the Lord then than love. Ma always said they were trunk Baptists. I laughed because I could imagine us all going to church in a trunk. She explained they were called trunk Baptists because she kept their letter of membership in the big trunk beside her bed. They had been members of the Smokemont Baptist Church, but since they moved, they hadn't belonged to any church. I almost wish she hadn't explained, because Baptist in a trunk was funnier to think about. School started the last of August. The term would run until harvest time when we were all needed at home to work. The church building was also used for the school. It sat in a flat place where the road went in three directions. A stream ran in front of the building, People who joined the church were baptized in the water during the warm days. Nobody ever tested their faith by being baptized in the winter time. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God, Paul said. Pneumonia is not easy to cure. Children walked two or more miles to school in the morning and back home again in the afternoon. Tardiness was not permitted. If we were going to play along the way, we had to leave home earlier some of the children had to get up as early as 5 o'clock to do their chores and get to school on time. All six grades were together in one room. Our teacher, Horace Williams, was the best we ever had. He knew and understood shy mountain children. It didn't matter to him that we smelled of lye soap, wore the same dress all week, and had bare, dusty feet. He lifted the little ones on his lap and taught them poetry and songs. You can be as smart as anybody and go as far as anybody if you try, he told us. I hadn't been to school since my shameful failure in Waynesville. Pa and Ma had taught me to read and write, so I started in the second McGuffey Reader and Speller. Learning was going to be fun, but playing at recess and walking to and from school with my cousins was going to be even more fun. We had a special song all the grades sang together. It was an easy way to learn geography and was lots of fun. What did Tenna see, boys? What did Tenna see? Tennessee. I ask you men as a personal friend, what did Tenna see? She saw what Arkansas, boys. She saw what Arkansas, Arkansas. I'll tell you then, as a personal friend, she saw what Arkansas. Where has Oregon, boys? Where has Oregon, boys? Oregon. She's taken Oklahoma, boys. Oklahoma. How did Wisconsin... <laughs> it's hard to say them if you know what they're doing. How did Wisconsin sin, boys? How did Wisconsin sin, Wisconsin? She stole a new brass key, boys, Nebraska. What did Della wear, boys, Delaware? She wore a New Jersey, boys, New Jersey. Where did Idaho, boys, Idaho? She hoed in Maryland, boys, Maryland. What did Iowa weigh, boys, Iowa weigh, Iowa? She weighed a washing ton, boys. Washington. What did Missy sip, boys? Mississippi. She sipped her mini soda, Minnesota. What did Connie cut, boys? Connecticut. She cut her shaggy mane, boys? Maine. What did Ohio, oh, boys? Ohio. She owed her taxes, boy, Texas. How did Flora die, boys? Florida. She died of misery, boys, Missouri. 
on our walk home after school, we girls sang the question and the boys sang the answer. By the time we got within sight of the farm, we'd named all the states. The two mile walk was filled with adventure. About a mile from home, we'd pause at Mr. Watson's and watch his peacock. I'd never seen a bird so very beautiful. If we came near the fence, he'd spread his colorful fan-like tail feathers and show off for us. The little pea hen wasn't pretty at all. I felt sorry for her because her husband got to wear all the beautiful feathers and prance around. She was a small, brown, timid thing. It all seemed turned around. Girls were supposed to be fancier than boys. Further on down the road, we'd all huddle together and walk on the side of the other road away from Andy Marshall's dog. He was a big, mean dog with a big bark. He didn't come out of the yard, but he acted so mean we were afraid. Richard, Noah, and Arthur said they weren't afraid of him, but they stayed as far away as we did. The marshals seemed wealthy to me. Ma and I had visited with them in the summer. They had an organ in a room built especially for it. Mrs. Marshall let me stand in the doorway and look at it, but I couldn't touch it. It was beautiful. I had no idea what kind of sound it would make. Other than Ma's banjo, a guitar, a fiddle, and a jew's harp, I had never heard any kind of musical instrument. I wanted Mrs. Marshall to play for me, but she and Ma were busy talking. Chestnut trees grew along the road. Filling our hands and pockets with the nuts, we'd go into Lidge Wilson's little store to trade. The store was on the right side of the road to school in one of the few flat places between the hills. We traded chestnuts for slates and pencils, and sometimes we'd get candy to go with our lunch. Lunch was always biscuits and pork, fruit or baked sweet potatoes, and an occasional piece of stack cake. Fridays were my favorite days. Spelling bees were held every Friday afternoon. The smaller children didn't last long in the contest. Then one by one, the older boys and girls missed words and sat down. Dicey and I went down in the last round, or more often, one of us won. We'd study all week so our chances would be good. All my books were exciting. People and places different from our own small world filled every page. Abraham Lincoln could have been part of the world where we still lived. He, too, read by oil lamp or candlelight. His clothes were rough and homemade like ours, and he lived in a one-room log cabin. It didn't seem possible that he had been born in 1809, a hundred years ago. Were we that far behind the rest of the world? We were living like Mr. Lincoln now. We can understand his world, but the other world of kings and queens or princes and princesses, wealth and fame, were only in fairy stories. How could two different worlds exist on so small a place as the earth? Out beyond the mountains lay a fantasy world. Snowy white beaches covered with seashells, foamy ocean water keeping time with the moon, railroad cars with soft beds in private rooms, fancy hats and dresses bought in a store, silver, gold, crystal, and china on white linen tablecloths, chairs that were cushioned and soft to sit on, and buildings that held enough books to read in a lifetime. Poets and writers wrote about these things, so they must be true. Out beyond the rounded hills of Boogertown, life was different and hard to understand. Were we backward and poor, or were we more blessed because we were isolated and unaware of the worldly progress? Questions filled my head. The answers were hard to find. Fall was coming, and we knew our school days were few. In September, nature begins to paint the mountains in vivid colors. Dogwood trees put on their red dress first. Soon they were joined by the yellow poplar, scarlet and yellow maples, and the oak in shades of brown. Goldenrod, blue and white fall asters, Queen Anne's lace, and lacy purple flowers grew alongside the road. On both sides of the road, field after field had shocks of corn and orange pumpkins. The scent of drying tobacco came from the barns. Tobacco meant winter clothing and food for most people. Neighbors helped each other when it was time to grade and hand off the tobacco. It would be taken to Knoxville to be sold at giant warehouses. Pa always kept some to make a twist for chewing and some to chop and age for his pipe. The morning breeze already turned our noses red and made toes on our bare feet sting. 
A poem in my second reader always described fall best for me. Come, little leaves, said the wind one day. Come o'er the meadow with me and play. Put on your dresses of red and gold, for summer is gone and the days grow cold. Soon as the leaves heard the wind's loud call, down they came, fluttering one and all. Over the brown fields they danced and flew, singing the soft little songs they knew. Dancing and whirling, the leaves went. Winter had called them, and they were content. Soon, fast asleep in their earthly beds, the snow laid a coverlet over their heads. Hickory nuts and black walnuts fell soon after the leaves. Ma sent Lola, Luther, and me out to pick up as many as we could. Ma sometimes went with us and filled her long apron with them. Hickory nuts shed their outside covering before we picked them up, but the walnuts still kept their green rough skin. We stored them in a dry place until their skin turned brown. The green walnuts oozed a juice that stained your hands yellow-brown and was impossible to wash off. My hands had stains all fall. I kept them in my lap as much as possible at school. Eventually, the dye faded, and by then, it was time to remove the brown outer skin from the walnuts so they could finish drying. The skin was tough. You needed a big rock to lay the nuts on and a hammer or another rock to pound the skin loose. The walnut fell out of the skin, revealing still another sharp ridged shell, which also had to be broken before the tasty meat appeared. It was a lot of hard work, but we knew how good they would taste in the winter. Sometime in September, Uncle Aiden wrote Pa that he had a good razorback sow for him if he could come and get her before the snow set in and he couldn't cross the mountain. Pa started off to the other side of the Smokies. He knew it would take him a good day to walk to Lufty. Not taking time to visit, Pa left early the next morning to bring the sow back across the mountain. How do you lead a razorback? Pa quickly found out. You don't. She taught him that a hog cannot be led like a cow or a horse. She wouldn't let him tie a rope around her neck, and she had her own ideals about the best way to travel. Horace Capar, an early explorer of the Smokies, had met the mountain razorbacks and had his troubles with them. He said, Besides man, the razorback is the only mammal whose eyes will not shine by reflected light. They are too bold and crafty. The Razorback has a mind of his own, not instinct, but mind, whatever psychologists say. He thinks. Anybody can see that when he is not rooting or sleeping, he is studying devilment. He shows remarkable understanding of human speech, especially profane speech, and even an uncanny gift of reading men's thoughts whenever these thoughts are directed against the peace and dignity of pigship. He bears grudges, broods over indignities, and plans revenge for tomorrow or the week after. If he cannot get even with you, he will lay wait for your unsuspecting friends. As long as Pa kept his eyes on her, she'd behave. The minute his thoughts wandered, she'd run for a laurel thicket and hide. Pa'd get a stick to poke and prod her out, only to have her dart ahead of him and up a mountainside. After losing several skirmishes with her, Pa wrestled her to the ground and firmly tied the rope around her hind leg. When she wandered from the path, he'd give a jerk and get her back on the straight and narrow. Pa and the sow were worn out when they finally got home. Pa's hands were blistered and rope burned. The sow was tired and mean. Friendship never developed between them. In all the years we kept her, she produced many fine litters, but Pa couldn't go past her pen without muttering slanderous things about her. She kept her black eyes on him and grunted in disgust. In early fall, Pa and Ma took apples and vegetables to the produce market in Knoxville. The trip there and back took three days and two nights. Sacks of red, yellow, and green apples and baskets of vegetables were loaded on the wagon. Ma took bed cover for camping out and food and utensils for cooking on the way. They'd get to Boyd's Creek, about 20 miles above Knoxville, in time to prepare to camp for the night. Pa removed the wagon seat and some of the baskets to make a place to sleep in the wagon. At sunup, Ma cooked breakfast over an open fire, and they went on to the market. 
If everything went well, they'd sell the produce and get back to Boyd's Creek for the night. Ma always brought light bread and bologna sausage home for our treat. It was a delicious change from biscuits and pork. Luther always managed to get the last slice of bread. Harvest and preserving and canning took most of Pa and Ma's time now. All the potatoes, apples, turnips, cabbage, and sweet potatoes had to be put in the root cellar. The root cellar was a hole dug in a hillside or just a hole in the ground. It had to be a place where the ground was dry. After the fruit and vegetables had been carefully chosen, they were put in the straw-lined cellar. The top was also covered with straw and boards. The boards were spaced so plenty of air could reach the bottom of the hole. Bruised fruit or vegetables were never put in because, as the old saying goes, one rotten apple can spoil the whole barrel. Green beans were canned, pickled, or dried. Some people broke their beans, but Ma dried hers whole. After stringing them on thread, she kept them in the sun for several days until they were brown and shriveled. They were called leather breeches and hung from the rafters along the wall with the onions. The onions were braided into ropes by using their long green tops. A lot of beans were shelled and dried. Ma made soup beans out of them. She cooked them all day with a piece of side meat or flavoring, far flavoring. Canned tomatoes and corn bread were usually served with them. Pickled beans recipe. You need an eight gallon crock, a bushel of green beans, broken, it makes about two gallons. Cook green beans until they change color from green to yellow brown. While beans are cooling, shuck 18 ears of corn. Cut corn off the cobs. Chop three firm heads of cabbage until it looks like slaw. Mix corn and cabbage together, but do not cook. Add beans when they are cool. Use one round box of plain salt on bean, cabbage, and corn mixture. The taste will be saltier than you would want to eat. Put mixture into a crock. Take outer leaves removed earlier from cabbage and spread over the mixture until it is completely covered. Put a saucer or plate on top of mixture. A clean, heavy rock wrapped in foil should be placed on top of the dish. Tie cloth over the top of crock and let set for eight days. After pickling time, boil the mixture, pack in mason jars, and seal. Remember, no water is added to the crock at any time. Cabbage was either preserved whole in the cellar or made into sauerkraut. Some cabbage was put into the crock of pickled beans. Whole ears of corn were pickled too. Tomatoes that were still green at frost time were made into relish or chow chow. After the first hard freeze, the time I hated most, Pa slaughtered the pigs. I always got as far away as I could when the dreaded day arrived. I'd put on my heavy coat and go into the woods so I couldn't hear any of the noise and commotion. Farm children are supposed to accept this fall ritual as life's necessity, but I never could. It was a gory, horrible time that I would do anything to escape. True, I loved tenderloin and ham, but I wished with all my heart that there was some other way to get food. I tried not to make friends with the piglets in the spring because I knew what fall would bring. When I was sure the worst was over, I'd return home. Pa had dressed the pigs, and Ma and Granny Jane had a roaring fire under the big black wash kettle. The fresh meat was ready for storing away. The hams would be cured with salt. Sausage was ground, made into little balls, cooked, and canned in their own grease. Ma never used sage in her sausage, just salt and pepper. All the fat was being rendered in the wash kettle to make lard for cooking. Lard was stored in buckets and kept in the spring house to keep it from getting rancid before it could be used. The little pieces of meat left after rendering were called cracklings and were put into cornbread. Nothing was so good as fresh crackling bread. Ma would have fresh backbones and ribs and crackling bread for supper. Somehow in my mind, the meat was not connected to the horrible fate the pigs met. Pa, Grandpa, and Uncle Dave harvested the wheat, corn, and hay. The wheat and corn were taken to Billy Wilson's grist mill to be made into cornmeal and flour. The husks and chaff made bran for the cows. Ma, Aunt Rentha, and Granny Jane made hominy out of the next best corn. The corn was soaked in lye water until the hard outer husk burst and came off. The snowy white corn was washed until the water ran clear. Hominy is best cooked in bacon grease with salt and pepper. 
Our cows were very important to us. Fresh milk and butter were prized above anything else. It didn't matter what else we had to eat if we could have fresh cold milk and butter to go with our bread. Cornbread crumbled into a tall glass and filled with milk was better than the best of cereals now. Warm yellow butter on a hot biscuit tempted everyone. Honey and butter scooped up with a big piece of bread was pure delight. Milk and butter kept well in the spring house. Most all farms had at least one small cold spring running out of the hillside. A small log house was built over the spring with the spring running directly down the middle. The house had to be built well and all the cracks filled so that the cold from the running water stayed inside the house. Steps were built on each side of the spring to hold the buckets of milk and butter. Shelves built along the walls held all the canned goods and the lard. We learned early never to leave the door of the spring house open. It was too cold to be comfortable in the spring house, so there was no danger of us playing in there. Cold air rushed out when the door opened. Even in the heat of summer, the floor was so cold it hurt bare feet. The temperature stayed the same, never freezing in the winter. Jelly and jam had already been made. Gooseberries, huckleberries, and blackberries ripened at different times during the summer. We went up on the hillsides to find huckleberries and gooseberries. Blackberries grew in pasture fields and open lands along the fence rows. Huckleberries and gooseberries were easier to pick. They both grew on low bushes with no prickly vines. The danger from snakes was not so great. Now the blackberry briar was something different. It was a favorite hiding place for copperheads and rattlesnakes. Several times Ma had been up on one before she noticed it. Rattlers gave you fair warning before they struck, but the copperheads were silent, mean, and sneaky. We'd take our buckets into the fields before the sun got so hot. Dew wet our skirts as we reached and stooped to get the biggest berries. By noon, our buckets were full and our hands were covered with scratches and red from berry juice. Ma would have to remove briar points from our hands. Yellow jackets and hornets helped themselves to our berries. Not all the berries were made into jelly. Ma canned a lot without sugar to be made into cobbler pies later in the winter. Gooseberries were tart and sour. Pa used to say Ma should use all the sugar in the house and borrow an extra cup to get the gooseberry pie sweet enough. Canning in glass jars was something new for Ma. We didn't know there was such things until we came to Oldham's Creek. Our food had always been cured, dried, or stored in earthen crocks. Glass jars made preserving easier and the food prettier. Pa had to go to the glades to buy sugar for canning. Sometimes Lola and I would go with him in the wagon. The store kept a little of everything we needed. Kerosene oil, cloth, axes, mattox, hammer, and hoe handles, patent medicine, candy, and a few toys. While Pa took care of the buying, Lola and I looked at everything. Near the front window, two dolls smiled at us. They were beautiful. We'd never had dolls to play with. Indeed, we'd never seen one this close before. Their black hair was painted on their china heads, blue eyes looked steadily at us, and their red bow mouths smiled sweetly. Their long, lacy dresses covered cloth bodies, and tiny china feet showed at the hem of the skirt. Pa, look at the doll! Pa looked and smiled, but didn't say anything. We both knew we couldn't have them, but oh, how we wanted them. After we started home, Lola and I begged Pa to please get them for us. Please, Pa, please, just get one of them and we'll share. Maybe sometime, he said. We knew not to talk to Ma about them. She didn't see any need in buying foolish things for her children. It was enough if we had clothing to wear and plenty to eat. In a way, Ma was right. We were blessed to have the necessary things in life, but Pa knew how much we wanted the dolls, and if he could, he'd get them for us. All our heating and cooking was done with wood. Pa kept the stack up to a certain level outside the cabin door. With cold weather settling in, we were going to need much more wood. He took the horse and sled into the hills to bring back logs to be split and stacked. Sometimes he took his rifle and brought back a squirrel for supper. The first snow flurries came in November, with heavier snow after Thanksgiving. 
Ma and Pa never celebrated Thanksgiving. I knew about the Mayflower and Pilgrims from my school books, but Thanksgiving was just another day to us. One thing impressed me, the Indians brought parched corn for the Pilgrims to eat on the first Thanksgiving. Ma fixed parched corn for us on cold winter days when we couldn't go outside. The Cherokees had taught her how to roast the kernels brown and crisp. Pa and Ma always tried to keep enough sugar and coffee to last through a long snowstorm. The farm produced everything we needed except kerosene for the lamps and sugar and coffee. Pa was going to the glades to trade. Trading was just what he was doing. He had taken apples and vegetables out of the cellar to trade for the things we needed. He was gone all afternoon. We watched for him to appear on the trail in back of Aunt Rentha's cabin, hoping for a taste of candy. We were impatient. Finally, he came with several bundles stuffed in sacks on each side of the horse saddle. The sugar and coffee were there and candy for Luther, Lola, and me. Another package lay beside his chair. What's in there, Pa? I asked. Open it and find out, Pa laughed. Lola untied the string and the brown paper opened just enough to show two blue eyes and a little red mouth. I couldn't believe my eyes. Too surprised to move, I stood and looked while Lola opened the package and grabbed one of the dolls. The other doll was for me. Pa's big hand reached down and placed the doll in my arms. My heart felt big. My heart felt big and noisy and tears filled my eyes. Thank you, Pa, I said. He patted my head and smiled. There was no need to say anything else. Snow fell several times after Thanksgiving, but the real winter weather didn't come until after Christmas. Usually fair weather held long enough for Pa to hunt fresh meat for Christmas dinner, squirrel, quail, or perhaps a wild turkey. Christmas in the mountains was bleak and uneventful. Sometimes the days passed without us being aware it was a holiday season. We had no Santa Claus or Christmas tree. Since our Christmas in Spartanburg, Ma had let us hang up our stockings. That was as far as she let us go with our celebration. When we did hang up our stockings, we'd get an orange and a piece of candy, never anything to play with. The mountain people still kept the ancient customs of the native lands. Many Highlanders disapproved of the new Christmas observed on December 25th. In Scotland and Ireland, the day of Christmas was January 5th, a day of solemn celebration. Early Christmases had become so steeped in pagan rituals that in 1647, the English Parliament outlawed Christmas decorations and celebrations. No symbols such as holly, mistletoe, trees, or most of the carols were permitted. Religious singing was restricted to the singing of the Psalms. This was the Christmas brought to America by the Highlanders. A carol or two were remembered and sung. Legends survived in folklore, but a Puritan Christmas was what we observed. In some families, the good book was taken from the shelf or gently removed from the trunk and the story of Christ's birth read aloud. The carols we remembered were the traditional songs of England and Scotland. The cherry tree carol is one of the oldest I know. The cherry tree carol. Then Mary spoke to Joseph, so meek and so mild. Joseph, gather me some cherries, for I am great with child. Then Joseph flew in anger, in anger flew he. Let the father of the baby gather cherries for thee. Then Jesus spoke a few words, a few words spoke he. Let my mother have some cherries, bow down low, cherry tree. The cherry tree bowed down low, bowed low down to the ground. And Mary gathered cherries while Joseph stood around. Then Joseph took Mary on his right knee. What have I done? Lord, have mercy on me. Then Joseph took Mary on his left knee. Oh, tell me, little baby, when will thy birthday be? On the 5th of January my birthday will be, when the stars and the elements shall tremble with glee. In a strange contradiction, while shunning all symbolic trappings of Christmas Day, they saw nothing wrong with noise-making. The men and boys provided the noise for the celebration. They go into the woods and shoot their guns at nothing at all. All day long, shots echoed from one mountain to another. Some of the more exuberant kept their spirits up by drinking homemade spirits. Pa and Ma criticized such doings and ignored them when they could. Many legends and superstitions came to the mountains with our ancestors. 
One legend says that on Christmas Eve, the animals talk. Bees in their hives are said to hum the melody of an ancient carol from dusk till dawn. The old people say they have heard the music of the bees and have seen cows kneel and speak. On this holy night, the plants will bloom as they did when Christ was born. Although covered with snow, underneath the ground is covered with soft green vegetation. Old Christmas, or January 5th, is surrounded with superstitious beliefs. On this day, the dawn comes twice. The first dawn comes about an hour earlier than usual, and the skies brighten until sunlight seems close. The pokeweed sends up sprouts big enough for everyone to see if they're lucky enough to be awake. When dark returns, the sprouts die, then the true dawn appears. Also, the week before Christmas, roosters crow in the middle of the night, trying to make the day come sooner. You can hear an angel sing if you're willing to pay the price. If you sit under a pine tree on Christmas Eve, angel voices will sing all around you. The price you pay for this miracle is death. You won't live to see the sunrise again. Wear something fresh and new on Christmas and your luck will be good. Don't wash clothes on the Friday before Christmas if you want to stay out of trouble. Don't let the fire go out on Christmas morning or spirits will come and take you away. Don't give your friends or neighbors a match, a warm coal, or even a light to be taken out of the house. If you do, you'll be giving away your hope of a good future. If you leave a piece of bread on the table after Christmas supper, you'll have enough to eat until the next Christmas. New Year's Day had its own superstitions. It is an old Scottish belief that it, you will have good fortune in the coming year if the first visitor after midnight on December 31st is a dark-haired person. This person acts as first footer and brings good luck and blessings. Eat black-eyed peas and hog jowl on New Year's Day for good luck all year. If you hang out a washing on New Year's Day, you'll be washing every day for the next year. Don't sweep out the house on New Year's morning or some of your family will be swept away from you before next January 1st. Never carry ashes out of the house on New Year's Day or you or someone in your family will have bad luck or death. The same is said for pouring out dirty water. Don't cut your hair or trim your nails on New Year's Day or you'll cut your good fortune. It's bad luck to see a red-haired person on New Year's Day. If one comes towards you, turn aside and don't look at him. No matter how pretty your new calendar is, never put it up or refer to it before dawn on New Year's Day. We ate the black-eyed peas and hog jowls and didn't hang up the calendar before dawn, but we gave no thought to the other advice. Our calendars came from the store in the Glades. They were given out by a patent medicine company that claimed to have the perfect cure for all human ailments. I was always happy to see January torn off the calendar. February was the month of promise. Spring was coming soon. Another fascinating uh, look at Dory's life there. So many things jumped out at me that I had to jot them all down. I had to write them down this time. Um, in, the, in the very beginning, I love the opening scene of her and the turkey. <laughs> Not that she got flogged by the turkey, but when I was a little girl, my Uncle Henry had turkeys. Uh, he didn't always have them, but for some reason, just that one time, he had about five. And they seemed so big. They were so big. Um, and I wasn't that little. Maybe, I don't remember if maybe I was like 10, 11, 12, something like that. Probably about the same age as Dory by this point. But they just seemed like they were as tall as I was. And I hated it when they, when I'd have to walk down the road or, um, get, catch the school bus or something. And they would be out and about. And I would always be afraid that they would, they would come after me. They didn't really ever flog me. And I don't think they flogged anybody else. But they would just come running up to you. And, and they were intimidating for sure. So I, I liked that part. Um, and also, uh, kind of on the same part, her daddy having to bring the hog back over the mountain. I would not have liked to do that. I mean, that would have been a, a, a chore for sure, but of course he did it so that he could um, have meat for his family. Then that sow ended up giving him a lot of uh, meat on throughout the years when she produced litters for him. 
but it reminds me of a time when my uh, papa still had hogs and me and one of my cousins one time was just walking down the road for something to do well we didn't realize the hogs were kind of down the road from all the houses and we didn't realize that they had got out somehow and so then they chased us and they were chased we, we run home and they chased us all the way back up the road and we were both screaming and of course everybody laughed at us and said they just wanted to be fed they weren't trying to hurt us they but we were just uh, really hysterical over it uh, and another kind of incident like that it's probably not the same type of hog for sure but wild ones were mad deer hunts in georgia there's a lot of them and one year he told me just i just laughed and laughed and he said it wasn't funny to him but i thought it was a real funny story that of course when he goes to the deer stand in the morning he goes before daylight so it's dark you know and you can't really see and he was on his way to his deer stand and then he hears he said it hurt it sounded like a herd of miniature horses like coming after him well he knew it was it was hogs is what it was so then it was him trying to climb up the tree to get away from them uh, and I just laughed and laughed because I thought it was so funny but he didn't think it was that funny but that those that part reminded me of those two stories and the part where she was uh, where the church let her learn Bible verses like that and then the next week you know she would come back to Sunday school and, and recite her verse that reminded me pap told me when he was a boy he went to a school a local school it's uh, no longer um, it's is the building still there but it hadn't been a school and even in my lifetime but Ogden was the name of it Ogden school it was an elementary school and he said when he went to Ogden he didn't really remember who these people were but a group of people would come and they would teach them Bible verses and then when they come back if you could still recite your Bible verse they gave you a little prize so he said he always made sure that he remembered his because he you know of course they were kind of like Dory's family they didn't get any extra so he was wanting that prize and I don't even remember if he told me what the prize was but he would always make sure to, to memorize his verse so that when they come back he could he could get the prize that they offered and the I like the part about when she's there um, take the chestnuts into the store to trade for other things that was probably I mean you've probably already read about it or heard about it but probably one of the biggest impacts on uh, the Appalachian Mountains was the chestnut blight. It just totally changed the way of life for so many people. It was the chestnut trees just played such a huge role in in every just the very fabric of people's lives in those days. Of course, from the the food they provided, like Dory was talking about uh, trading, but they didn't just provide food for people. They provided mass for uh, animals. Domesticated, people would gather them for those to feed their animals, but also for wild animals, of course. And then the very wood of the tree, people used it for building, uh, to start. It was great firewood, just so many different ways. Uh, Papa Wade said that when he was a boy, kind of in the same time frame, that, um, but living in the mountains of North Carolina, instead of there over on the Tennessee side, he would have been back on the North Carolina side and, and more out towards uh, Asheville, Buncombe County, Madison County. Madison County is where he would have been. But he could remember that, um, like maybe there would be a chestnut tree like on a bank or something, you know, along a road. And it literally there would just be so much mass that you could just walk along the edge of the road in the ditch. And that's where they would gather the chestnuts then to take and trade or to, uh, to take home and eat. You know, you could make bread out of them. You could eat them raw. You could do, you know, bake them, all these different things. But he could remember that they were so plentiful that you could just pick them. You just take your sack and just pick them up as you went. And there they lay just for the taking. And of course, by the time my dad, Pap, come along, the chestnuts were died out. They were gone. You know, the blight had killed them. But he could remember uh, lots of times being back in the mountains hunting and stuff and seeing like an old, old um, remains of what was left. And he said they always thought, made him think of uh, white ghosts standing there because they just, because they were dead and they were kind of decayed. But chestnut would last a really, really long time. So you, they were still there at that point. And um, he said, you know, it, they just kind of had this look about them that made them stand out there. But also, they were kind of a ghost of what had been, you know, of that previous um, grandeur that just was everywhere before the blight. So that's a really interesting part. And then, of course, the black walnuts. Um, I love black walnuts, and I grew up in a family that gathered them and processed them, and, and we've done that too. Uh, Miss Cindy has big, two big, three big um, 
walnut trees at the place she lives now. There's walnut trees on the road I live on, although two of them have died recently. Anyway, but black walnuts, I love them. And that's, they're a, a nut, if you've never had a black walnut, they're way stronger, have a more distinct taste than like a regular English walnut. Matt does not like black walnuts like I do. I could just sit and eat them out of hand, but I love them in pies and cakes and cookies. I loved all the talk, really, the when she's describing all the food that they put up and the, you know, hanging the, making the leather bridges and hanging the onions and, and curing the pork and all that. I loved all that. It makes me wish I could do all those things. I do put up a lot of food for my family, but oh, I wish we had land enough to have hogs and, and you know, uh, have a bigger farm. Uh, really, I wish I had a farm. <laughs> That's it. I wish I had a place for a hog, but... Uh, to have more garden space like I can't really grow corn good here at my house because there's just not enough sunshine nor enough space either one so I really loved all that part and then at the very end kind of the uh, the superstitions those are, are a lot of those are still alive and well today and it's it's funny there are some people that really believe them earnestly but most people don't but somehow they just keep getting regurgitated or keep hanging on somehow like the first footer that's still really common that you want that but people don't you know i always thought well you could orchestrate that you could just call somebody hey you got dark hair come over <laughs> you know i want you to be the first person in my house so i don't know how all that works and the one about uh turning away from the red hair person my question on that one is well what if you had red hair then what would you do Granny's family was a family of redheads. Uh, in our family, only one, my one nephew, has, uh, I guess what you'd call a ginger now, it's what people call, but has the coloring of the Jenkins. But that was a family full. So what did they do? Turn out half of their family? Anyway, some of them are silly, but a lot of them still hang on today. So I hope that you will... Uh, Oh, I wanted one other thing. I was thinking there was one more. The pickled beans. Did you not love that recipe? That was the other thing. So we've made pickled beans and corn, uh, but the expert, all-time expert, is Papa Tony, Matt's daddy. His are the best ever. I really wanted to film him doing his last year, and I didn't get to, so hopefully this year I can but just the best ever. But I'm going to have to run that recipe by him. It's been so long since I read Dory that I'd forgot about that, that they put no liquid, no liquid. So I've got to run that by Papa Tony and see what he thinks. But that makes me want to try Dory's mother's recipe. It was probably the one Dory used too after she was married, but I found that part really, really fascinating and interesting. So please leave a comment and let me know what you enjoyed about this chapter. And I hope that you'll come back next Friday. My readings are usually always on Fridays. So drop back by so that we can find out what happens to Dory, Woman of the Mountains, next.